Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, starring in The Shield, Entourage, The Wire, and hundreds of other shows and movies, Paul Ben Victor. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Rich Redman here. This is another episode of the Rich Redman Show, where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Jim McCarthy, in Spring Hill, Tennessee, and our guest today joining us from sunny Los Angeles. Jim, I'm so excited about this because this is one of perhaps the greatest character actors in the world. He's been entertaining audiences in film and TV and on the stage for decades. You might know him as the ruthless henchman Spiros Vandas and the critically acclaimed HBO series The Wire, and he played uh, the Warner Brothers studio head Alan Gray in HBO's Honorage. And if that wasn't enough, he was just in Marty Scorsese's Marty Marty Scorsese's The Irishman. Of course, I'm talking about Paul Ben Victor. How are you, man? Yeah, buddy. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Thanks for joining us. Nice intro. I appreciate that. Which yeah. part of the um, the um, SoCal land are you in? I'm in uh, Topanga Canyon up by Malibu, so we're in the Beautiful. Hood. Been some fires uh, in the distance, you know, but it is a little smoky, but we're very, very safe and sound at the moment, but thanks. Yeah, yeah, it is fire season in Los Angeles. Uh, got- nuts, yeah. So uh, our prayers go out to those who aren't doing so well, so yeah. Yeah. Mm. definitely it- think about everybody, yeah. It seems to be the luck of the draw on that geographically. Who gets hit every year? It's 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 touch and go. It's gotten worse the past few years. Not to be a downer, but yeah, it's gotten worse. You know, Malibu last year, the Ventura fires. It's, yeah, yeah it sort of in a little yeah, but it's it's not good. Not yeah. good. Well, I, I owe this conversation to uh, our friend Steve Cooper, a longtime friend of mine, coopertalk.net. You guys had an amazing conversation. He's a really funny man. He's got like 800 episodes of talking to great character actors like yourself, and uh, he connected us. Uh, but right before we started rolling, we were talking about the drums. I was explaining how I've been a drummer since dinosaurs roamed the earth in 1976. I got a pair of sticks, and it's been an amazing path. Jim also plays drums. You played drums. That was my first love. Way before the dinosaurs, I was doing. <laughs> I grew up. I was. I mean, I wish I had a photograph because if it was today, there'd be a lot of. Photo. I built a set, and I remember this. I was three or four, and I had, I had cartons. You know, we didn't. Have, I didn't have drums yet. My parents finally got me a little kit, but I had, you know, in sizes. I remember it was, and I had probably one, two, three, probably four boxes. You know that I'd nice. sit down. And I remember just banging at him. This is one of my earliest memories. I think I was three and a half or four years old. I made my own set. I don't know yeah. how I did. I have no clue, but I wish I had a picture of me like when I was at. And then I studied. I studied for, you know, like classical drums with this guy. I don't want to mention any names because he was a bore. And he's <laughs> the biggest, one of the biggest classical teachers in the world right now at, at, in New York. I don't want to... Anyway, like Eastman sure. or Juilliard or something like that. Yeah, exactly. And he was a fucking bore. Can I say fuck? Sure, sure, you can say whatever you want. The FCC is not on us. I remember him smiling once. I wasn't the best practicing person, but but anyway, it was snare drum, you know, stuff for seven years. And wow, you did that for seven years? So you were seven years, seven years. So I was really good. You know, I, I took lessons years later. I said, well, you have really good hands, but I was doing traditional this way, you know. Oh, yeah. So I, I was good on snare drum and all the rudiments and stuff like that, but I never sat down and, and rocked out. And that I learned a little later for a few other And then I dropped it when I got into high school. I went to Manhattan School of Music at 12, 13. You wow. Know, mostly like classical training, but I wanted to, but I was in rock bands, so it, it didn't flow. You know well, I mean? who, was, who was the rock guy? What was your, who were your bands? Who did you want to? Oh, Let's get to that. I mean, yeah. you know, immediately David Garibaldi comes to mind. You know? Wow, Tower of Power. All right. Oh, yeah. Because I love Tower of Power, but he's, what he's done is amazing. Um, you know, uh, James Taylor's guy who's done everything. What's his name? Oh, Russ Kunkel? No, that's before. Russ Kunkel was early. Oh, um, Carlos Vega? Steve. Uh, um, Steve Gatt. 
Steve Gadd. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just beautiful player. Uh, and then hard rock guys, I don't know the names as well, but, you know, I go back to Billy Cobham and those guys. Man. Buddy, Buddy Rich is who I grew up with watching, of course. The yeah. King. I recently, and I YouTube once in a while, just great drummers or single stroke rolls and all this stuff. This is going to be boring to people. But anyway. No, it's drum- not. Are you kidding me? I, and Steve didn't tell me you were, you were a drummer. I mean, that's like, it's, I, I'm adding you to this growing list of celebrities and actors that have a relationship with the drums. And you know who's really into the drums right now? We just watched his latest th- thing that he directed. John Stewart is like, just, oh. it's like his new midlife hobby. He's like really into it. Wow. Comedy Central, John Stewart. Daily yeah, Show? Really? yeah. I mean, I mean, you got you got Stamos. You got the you know the, what was the guy from Wayne's World? Ding. I mean, so many guys. Yeah, I wanted to pick it back up. I have a little rolling drum kit in the basement. Yeah, sitting there getting dust. But um, I threatened to get a new. I'll get one one day and just you know. But then I had a teacher for a couple of days, a couple of sessions, who really taught me how to like kick it and hold it down and. That's where I wanted to go for the, like really just be that guy, you know, learn how to like the really hold it down. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, what that's about. And I didn't learn that as a kid. I, I wanted to really continue that, that, that concept of what we're about, what drummers are supposed to just play in the groove and owning it. it. I guess it's like an actor, like, you know, researching your part, memorizing your lines, showing up and, and not, like, and not being too, and not doing too much. Just you're there to be, the great dude that they say is one of the best police is guy, you know, what's Oh, Stuart Copeland. Yes. Yeah. Copeland. Not fancy at all. Right. Just keep yeah. it. He had know. some nice sparkle on there because he was a, he was an army brat. And so he grew up all over the world and got to soak up all these kind of like multicultural musical influences. Wow. You know, Jim's guy was Neil Peart uh, from Rush. Yeah. Peart, uh, Alex Van Halen was a big influence. Sure. Uh, I kind of got into the heavy stuff in the late eighties, early nineties. So, Anthrax and Metallica and Slayer and Megadeth. Oh yeah, and stuff. Yep. Talking about throwing it's, it down. So you're both drummers. We are. Yeah. Crazy. And we're and we're kind of frick and frack. It's like oil and water, and we're both Canadians. Now you're from Brooklyn, right? Yeah. I so, couldn't tell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if, there's, sure I am. if there's been a film or television show with Italians or Greek guys, Paul's been in it. I've been in one of them. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the Irishman. You're, I mean, every Italian actor that's been in every Italian themed movie was in that film. Yeah, that has to be a fun set. Oh God, it was incredible. Me and uh, Ray Romano were on set first day, and it's Ray Romano. Hey, mm. bigger than I, everybody, right? And he's like pinching me. We're pinching each other. He goes, this, 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 oh God. Same set, same time. We're both pinching ourselves, you know, sweating. And uh, from then on, it was, I just had a couple of days, but it was, it was astounding. I could tell you stories about it, but uh, I won't get too much into it. But it was, it was nerve wracking, you know? And I've heard other people, you get on set with De Niro and, you know, there he is. It's not just a guy you've been watching, but it's De Niro and it's Pacino. And these guys, I've seen a lot of, probably seven or eight of Pacino's Broadway plays. Yeah. Broadway, and even something at the actor's, a couple of things at the actor's studio I saw him do. I'm a member of the actor's studio, the old renowned actor's studio where I've seen him perform a couple of things. So here he is. And then... Oh, it's just incredible. And I, I acknowledge something he had done in Richard III, this wonderful piece that he did called Looking for Richard. It's not a people have seen, but it's about Shakespeare. And I said, he was talking to Ray about something. I said, Ray Ma, I said, well, Al, actually, I have that in a box set. And he looked at me and went, you have that? <laughs> I said, yeah, I do. And after the scene, I could share this even if somebody here. I only tell you that after the scene, we're done. He's running off. I said, Al, I just want to give me this. I heard comes around and gives me this hug. He goes, I really appreciate your, you know, that you, that you, some things you said about that. Cause I said, looking for Richard was unbelievable. He's incredible in it. When he screams out a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. Bellowing out this Pacino, you know, across the hills. Oh, Oh, my kingdom for us. It made so much sense. It wasn't just a horse. It was just, I give the fucking 
planet for a horse right now <laughs> in, in classic Pacino style. And I told him that when you said that, he gives me this hug. I was like, I don't know the guy. And it was the nice, one of the greatest moments of my life when he did that. And De Niro was there and I had just done grudge match with him a couple of years earlier. I had a yeah. small, had two, both small roles, no big deal. But to be on the set with him again was, was great. I wasn't as nervous, you know, but I've heard from, you know, pretty big actors, you get on set with these guys, it takes a day or two before you could just kind of relax. You know, it's a little, it's, it's, what are you going to do? Yeah. No. I and, and, nervous. um, or, I was so, I had nerves, but anyway, go ahead. Did you, uh, run across Sebastian Maniscalco? Were, Why were, you, were you guys in scenes together? I just, I think that he's like, well, he's the most popular comedian on the planet right now, maybe with Chris Hart. And I just love that story yeah. because, Kevin Hart. Oh, Kevin Hart, sorry. Um, Chris Hart <laughs> is the guy that gives me my drum heads from Remo Drumheads, so different Chris. Um, There's also a wrestler, I think, <laughs> Jericho. <laughs> but um, Kevin, uh, uh, Sebastian Maniscalco. Oh, funny. I just found out about him, I'd say, about a year ago. Yeah. And I could probably verbatim do at least a dozen of his routines, like yeah. word for word. This guy... I could turn this whole interview about him right now for the next hour, but he's, he's just that good. I, not just because he's just so funny, but, and I'm sure he's been told this, and if he ever saw this, and yes, we did run each other into each other in the green room on the way out to the premiere that we, Scorsese was there, we were at the Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood, you know, yeah. the traditional theater. We didn't even know, you know, it was the big event that closed off the street, and we all get... Uh, ushered off into the little holding cell green room down below in the lower depths of this theater. And uh, it's a little room, as big as a living room, and there's Pacino, and there's De Niro, and there's, and there's Pesci, and Maniscalco goes there. And, and we, I ran into him, I said, bro, dude, I'm just crazy. And he looked at me and went, hey, man, how you doing? And I became a little girl and just went, oh, instead of just being <laughs> cool. I said, no, watch you, you use funny this guy. He's like, okay, cool, cool. You know, like, like calm down. Yeah. Because I just was so an out. I just gotten into his stuff. It was so funny. And then he, he said, listen, I'll get you tickets. And then we sort of lost. He got, we had to get, but then Scorsese called us in one by one. But I did meet him and I was thrilled to meet him. And he was nervous too. It's like his, yeah. You know, he talks about it. He goes, I don't say nothing to nobody. I'm doing my job. I'm not that guy. I yeah. don't like people. Oh, the way he draws out his cadences and the and the, the, the some of the physical comedy that he uses to punctuate takes me right back to Jack Tripper, you know, uh, John Ritter, you know, Three's Company. And you know what's really funny is that I'm glad that I saw that and then I got to have my story corroborated because he said, "Yeah, I used to watch Three's Company episodes like they were game tapes, like scrimmages, like he would study." I watched those because he he got he was inspired by John Ritter. Yeah, that's what I heard in a couple of another interview. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Aren't you embarrassed? <laughs> my, uh, and my relatives love him too. So it's just great. So good. But that was what I was going to say. It was not just the comedy and his timing and all that. There's a plethora of characters. It's a whole world. His aunt, his grandmother, his, of course, his father, the guy on the aisle at the Whole Foods, the, the, the guy on the aisle, the three people in front of you at the aisle, the cash register. He just... And they're all in the Maniscalco world, of course, but each and every one of them is specific and different. And that's what I'm taken by, you know, you know, the army guy he takes the microphone, you see that when he turns it into the guys. Oh, yeah. Going, yeah. Guys going in and getting Bin Laden or something like that. It was, well, I, oh, I just I, love that you, you, you know, you've turned into a little girl and we have this reverence. People in the arts have a reverence for each other. And yeah. the fact that you guys are in some of these biggest film and television shows of all time. But in between, you love the craft so much that you're studying, you're auditioning, you're doing plays and you're keeping everything super sharp. And I just that the commitment to the craft. I just love that. Same thing, you know, with like musicians. There's so many commonalities yeah. there. But you ended up going to Carnegie Mellon, right? Is that where you got your training? But you started in set design, and then all of a sudden, you're like, oh, I'm going to do this. Do I have that story right? You sure do, and I'm impressed and I'm flattered. But yes, I was doing, after the drums, I dropped them like, like a, you know, like 
I don't want to say anything crude. Whatever. Like a down hot, Like a hot pancake. I don't know. That's right. Exactly. Like a good old Tennessee hot pancake. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. And I'll tell you what, y'all. Come back. But oh, uh, drop that. I saw a production that the theater, the high school was doing. Um, it was called Sing back then. And it, it, there's been some, it's like, a, it's like the TV show. Well, anyway, we created our own musicals. It was a competition. I saw it. I went, whoa. I got to do this and sort of building the sets. And then I started directing them and I became like the Mr. Singh guy in my high school for sophomore year, three years. And then we competed with the other schools and we won. And that was it. I was taken by the theater, the stage, the sets. And I built these wonderful little uh, models, these little, um, you know, scale models of the sets that we had built for the stage. Myself and my best friend, Mark Bennett, from years ago, we built a ship that came apart with a drawbridge and all this. And then we built a castle wow. that spun around. And oh, oh, no, that had the drawbridge. And it was a really intricate little set for a couple of high school guys. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go into set design because that's so cool. Got into Carnegie with these models. Definitely not for my grades because I basically didn't have grades. I- <laughs> I really didn't have grades. I mean, I could talk about it now. It's not a secret. I didn't go to school. I just found a way to have other people go to school for me and and do stuff. Take notes for me, man. Yeah. I was very creative in grade school, but I don't recommend it to any children watching this. This should be like X rated for you know kids in school, but I was very creative, but not scholastic, but I did these models, Carnegie. They brought me in and uh, in I was there for a couple of years doing sets and lights and scaffolds and hanging lights and all that. But I was hanging out with the actors called, they were called Dramats. And I very quickly sort of got into their world. And then I was asked to be in a couple of their little one act plays. And then I was asked to audition for that department and the rest was history. I auditioned and um, did a, a, a guy spraying for ants all over my property this morning. Oh, you got to get rid of those ants, man. Oh, they're crazy this year. Anyway, non-toxic, good stuff, healthy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's how it was. So it's set design at Carnegie and then the theater department acting. And then I went to New York. And, and then you're in it, you're in the game. Yeah. And then there's this period where you're doing commercials and there's this famous one, I guess, the McDonald's one where you're yeah. going to the football hall of fame. That was, that kind of put you on the map and fed you for a while. Is that, am I right there? Well, that was <laughs> actually toward the end of 10 years of them. I did. Oh, about, wow. Okay. I say close to 75 or 80 national big spots. Ah. And that was incredible. But I was also, so I was very, you know, I was very active and visible on TV every day, but I was also doing, the LA Laws and the Cagney and Lacey's and the NYPD Blues and the lots of little movies, but I was much more, you know, I was on a lot, but it was a lot of commercials. And back then, it wasn't cool to be an actor and do commercials, of course, mm. today. And yeah. I came to two or three actors, colleagues of mine, friends of mine, who were making fun of me at the time. I'm not going to mention any names. And of course, now everybody would kill for a campaign. Yeah. Everybody but back then it wasn't cool, but I was like, fuck it. I'm making good money. I like, I didn't have money and this was, I was good at it. Two or three big directors hired me all the time. Leslie Dector, Joe Pitka and Leslie and uh, Jim Gartner and a couple of others, you know, big, they, they grabbed me and, and started putting me in a lot of these spots. But yeah. Um, but I was also doing the other stuff and it was all a big conglomerate, you know, collage of, of work. Yeah. And I loved it. I, I love going to work. I love getting that call and doing a, I did a, you know, Pepsi spots with Cindy Crawford. I did the Bo Nose with Bo Jackson. And, and nice. I worked with, uh, you know, Michael Jordan and, uh, you know, for the Super Bowl spots that you saw. But yes, the McDonald's was a two year campaign. Uh, that's that's a forever. It was incredible. We were on all the time. We actually had a couple of companies come after me and Scott who were doing them together to develop a series, a uh, whole sh- screw up with that happened logistically and business wise. It, it's another story, but yeah, we, we were going to do a series together. 
So it was, it was, a, it's been a great run. I'm not, I don't, I wouldn't change any of, any of it. It was exciting. Yeah, you had amazing chemistry with that actor in that commercial. I mean, it was just, and you were funny, man, and just really funny. And you don't have a lot of time to get in there and get dirty, man. I mean, I love it. I mean, I've been, Jim knows I've been out in Hollywood acting for taking acting lessons for five years and taking auditions, taking anything that comes along. And um, I got no problem with commercials, man. I mean, it seems like nowadays there's no rules. You can do voiceover, you can do commercials, you can do features, you can do low budgets, television walk-ons, sign me up. Yeah, because there's so many, there's so many more people, I think, wanting to be in, it's worldwide. You could audition, I know, I think Scorsese hired um, some actors for, I think vinyl. We did vinyl. The yeah. Team. I, I know he hired an actress or an actor or two off of, uh, you know, a cell phone selfie from Europe. Yeah. Uh, and they got the job. So I got hired off of a selfie on my cell phone that Marty saw and put me in vinyl. So, um yeah, it's just so much more wide open. And I, uh, I mean, I just got offered a nice part in a, in a little Indian New York that's shooting next month. I might go do it with Liam Neeson and Vanessa Redgrave and some younger actors. I forgot the name. Um, you know, it's not, there's very little money, but I'll, you know, you want to go to work. But what you said earlier, it really touches home when you said it's not just the craft, but, you know, you, you're always in it. You're doing theater, film, and appreciating and getting things from other actors and like the Maniscalco appreciating what he's done and hearing that he, what he was inspired by, it's all part of our world. It's exciting. Yeah, like, very exciting. And yeah. I, I feel like that commonality is there with musicians as well, you know, because I've been riding a tour bus for, you know, 24 years and we go out and we take the music to the people and then during the week between everything i'm doing recording sessions for other people or writing songs or teaching people so the crowd just never stops and i just recognize that professionalism in you jim is always working and it makes me think paul our sponsor the school of rock i don't know if you're familiar with this they've got them all over los angeles but it's like kind of learn by doing so the kids are getting their hands dirty they're learning to play drums bass guitars keyboards they learn how to sing front to band they're playing like everything from uh, abba to zappa and they're always performing in the uh, for the public and it's just a really great thing there's 250 locations and jim we've got two of the best ones right here in nashville we got nashville location we got the franklin location there's one coming in mount julie it. Our friends Angie right. and Kelly McCright, they run an amazing program. So if you're, you got some parents out there, you want to get your kids involved in the School of Rock, they can learn life skills, time management, showing up, uh, working, taking direction, working as part of a team. What are the email addresses, Jim? Nashville at schoolofrock.com and Franklin at schoolofrock.com. Listen to that monster truck voice, man. You see, I keep this guy around, Paul. Sunday. <laughs> so, so thank you school of rock for uh, sponsoring our show we really really appreciate it yeah man but i just yeah you're you're a pro i, I can i can they take uh i want to study you want to say yeah excuse me uh, they've got <laughs> well <laughs> i think if you were up there on the drums you'd intimidate everybody you ready you better be ready. Yeah. Right? Here comes the count. There's like why is the guy from entourage kicking off wild thing <laughs> <laughs> Why is he playing? What, what are you looking Wipe at? Wipeout. Look at yeah. me. Look at them. <clears throat> yeah, I can see your count off with a band being very intimidated. Whoa! Don't, you know. Like, <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's good. So, we'll play. We'll play. Take it easy. Okay, all right, man. All right. Take it easy. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, Paul, would you say that that um, uh, NYPD Blue was probably make a turning point in your career? It's funny that you picked that up because you must be uh, watching some of my other interviews. Yeah, man, I did my research. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yes, you know, David Milch, I remember auditioning for that. And it was this huge chunk of dialogue. And I was kind of all over the place in the room and he was looking at me and, with the, you know, um, with that query eyed and chuckling a little bit. I walked out of there, it was on a Friday. I was so pissed all weekend because it up god damn it i was so upset with myself and then monday i got a call and i got it because i was i'm tough on myself i think as many of us creative types are and uh i got it and it was just it was such an exciting thing to do and he let me sort of riff and 
let me do my thing on, on set. I was improv a little bit, and then he kept throwing me stuff. But yes, that was it after that. That aired. And um, Milch then hired me again for John from Cincinnati a few years later. Nice. I remember Great that show. Yeah. yeah, I get a call. Um, and a uh, dear friend uh, called me up um, and, and let me know that we were going to be doing it together. And so uh, that was, yeah, there was NYPD Blue, did a bunch of those. But that, that was a turning point, yeah, for sure. Because... It was it was a it was it was the hottest show at the time, and I had a really juicy recurring character. So that, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Now, now, I, this is me just trying to steal some acting tips from you. Um, what happens when you get that big chunk of dialogue, and it's the day before, or it's the day of? Do you have a psychological process or memorization process? Um, and also, yeah. is it is it show to show, or am I right in saying that there's less leeway for ad libbing on TV versus film? Like some writers want it up, oh, you left out the comma before the last uh, ellipsis. Yeah, I think you kind of have to uh, sort of navigate the waters a little bit with that. Yeah, um, with Milsh, um, you know. When I was younger, I was a younger actor, some, well, whatever I am now, middle age, old, I don't know, whatever, but I was younger. <laughs> I was a lot more ballsy. And I got a first couple of jobs doing some improv stuff. I said, well, this is, I guess, how you do it. And I did it a lot. And until, like, I remember, God, and then I got in, like, trouble. You know, I'd get notes on some shows I did saying, would you please do one take as written? <laughs> and I was like offended. Yeah. You know, uh, God, it was so sort of stupid. There's nobody to teach you this stuff as a kid, you know, was, you know, there's no school for that. Your acting teacher doesn't teach you how to sort of negotiate and communicate with directors and writers and all that stuff. Especially if you're a little feisty, little sort of fighter, or somewhat angry younger actor, you know, yeah. trying to break in and fight, get that part. It's like, it's a war out there. And, you know, and, and you get on there, you want to do it your way. And how do you ask for that? And how do you just do it? So, and you don't want to just do it because there's so many great actors that do it and they're good at it. And you don't want to fuck it up. So, but I just, a lot of it is just sort of uh, taking a risk at the right time. Feeling it out. These days, I may say to the writer, you know, they know me. They know I've, uh, what I can do. I may say, can I just try, you know, I'll, I'll be much more polite and, and, and say, can I just try something this time? And I'll throw stuff out. And the director goes, go for it. Go for it. And yeah. the first thing they could say is no, right? Yeah. 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 We really, we really prefer to stick to this. The writers are here. They're watching. The network wants it done as written. I go, oh, okay. Okay, fine. Maybe. What about when you you have your selection of words that you just can't get out? Like, you know, just the ones that trip you up. As a voiceover guy myself, oh. regularly is a tough freaking word. <laughs> you know, I just had it in a script today and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I'm rushing. I'm trying to get it done so we can get on the interview. And I'm like, yeah, we regularly. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but you as a voiceover guy, you know what you do. You just slow it down and you get the word out, right? Nobody knows you're slowing it down, right? I, I use the cork. Oh, yeah, Nobody show us the, the cork, cork technique, bud. Cork. You get the, uh, you basically stick the cork in your mouth and you go regularly, 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 I regularly. The cork. Oh, the cork yep. technique. Yep. Warms yeah, the up the muscle. Later, I didn't know about the cork. Now you're telling me about the cork. I taught Paul Ben Victor. Come on, drum roll. Shh. You could have used it on his Pepperidge Farm and Gallo Wines. Uh, now you tell me. We remember. So that's a great advice on, you know, reading the room and figuring things out. And But be prepared to go word for word. Well, absolutely. And I've just been, you know, memorization is, I've read something recently. It's some people, De Niro takes lots of notes, and, and from what I understand, he does a lot of research. He does his sort of mind, you know, backstory stuff, and then walk, and you read about him. He says, 
His process is mostly in just the memorization, taking out the punctuations. You probably read about his, you know, and he, when it he, sounds good to him. And I'm more in that world of um, kind of both. I don't do a lot of notes, but if it's something, it, it's a lot of repetition and memorization for me. And hopefully the guy, you know, surfaces out, the way he's going to speak comes out. It, I equate it a lot to music. Sure. It's, you know, you're going to take a classic piece and you take the 15 best, say, guitarists in the world, and they're going to do their version. You know, it's just they're going to bring their talent to it that they've been nurturing for decades, and they're going to play it a little different than the George Harrison version. You know what I mean? So that's how I feel as, a, as an actor. I, I, you, you, you're playing your acts the way your talent sees it, and it's not as much up here for me. It's really a guttural thing, although I will put on a, sometimes I like to say it starts from the shoes. It's the walk. The guy has a certain walk. Mm -hmm. You know, he's got a lean, he's got that. And so, um, but in terms of what you asked before about memorization, Milch was renowned for going, here's a new page for you. We shoot and we're shooting this now. So take a look. Wow. At we're shooting this, you know, after lunch. And oof, so I would like not eat lunch, grab an assistant, run it while I'm breathing, just nonstop. And then I would also like, I have no problem with doing the Brando cue card method, you know? Oh, what is that? Just put up little notes and just wow. say, you right now, but if I have to go, 132 uh, centimeters of this and on a Tuesday at six o'clock, I'm going to go 432 centimeters. It's Tuesday, six o'clock. Mrs. Brown really wants you to be there. Don't be late because her daughter, Agatha, you know, and grab a few things, you know, ah. and have a little, you know, and, 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 you know, Brando, you know, he would put cue cards everywhere. You not know that? I did not know that. I'm He's learning so, today. So young. Teachable moments. Yeah, no. What about you could watch him, Jim probably know. You could watch him in The Godfather go, uh, you know, I was uh, family business, you know, and he's, he's reading on the ceiling. He's, he's wow. Reading. And then you could see later in some of the movies that didn't do very well, you could literally see him <laughs> reading, you know. The Isle of Dr. Moreau. Remember that one where he was, they did a reboot of that classic film and he played Dr. Moreau. Which I um, kind of... Hard to believe that Saturday Night Live, they still use cue cards. You can tell oh, they're reading all the time. It's yeah, a big, yeah, we did, our band did Saturday Night Live, and I got to see the, the guy that, I've got some cue cards hanging that I framed from the show we did, and uh, that guy's got this penmanship. It's all by hand. It's per beautiful oh, font. It's great. It's, all, it's old school. It's what about hearing it back? Like, you know, you ever go through a script and just read it through? And just listen to it over and over and over again. I mean, for me, that works a lot. I've mm -hmm. memorized entire comedic acts that way by listening to them over and over again. Well, like back in the old days, you'd listen to old, I remember listening to Richard Pryor routines or whatever, mm -hmm. Bill Murray routines, and like as a kid, and then you're able to just know them, or Maniscalco routines. But you mean reading them back and actually recording yourself, reading the script, and then listening to it back? I used to, believe it or not, at one point in time, I sold cars, right? And I wanted to really learn how to sell the other things that came along with selling a car. So all the guys that I would kind of learn from uh, had, you know, everything right up here as far as how they would pitch the customer. I'm like, I need to learn that. So I literally took my phone, sat my buddy down and said, sell me on this. What is it you say? And he, he, he said it. And he did like four or five different products. And I listened to that thing ad nauseum until I had it down. Mm. And it worked. Yes, repetition. Mm -hmm. That's my thing. It's just yeah. over and over and over again. I think, I think you know, Larry Bird, he would be out there hours longer than everybody else. Yep. Shooting but I mean, even, even with the guys like Pacino, De Niro, and Pesci, I mean, wouldn't you agree that at some point, that, I mean, the reason why they're so great is that they're kind of playing themselves, but just varied differently, right? The essence of their true personality is in there no matter what, kind of? Uh, yeah, and they're so interesting as human beings, and they're yeah. so... Uh, Legendary. Yeah, you know, we're all playing ourselves. We can't get yeah. much more than that. But, you know, even if you put on a 
Hulk costume it's still so I mean like Humphrey Bogart just pretty much played himself I don't think I've ever seen him do something with a Russian accent or anything like that <laughs> but the Americans you know so uh, and yeah I think actors they used, you know it's how interesting they are is once once the lights go on you know how, what what are they doing? What are they bring? What who they are? They're actors. Sometimes they're boring in real life, and you know, comics. Sometimes they're just not funny at all at the dinner table, but they're hilarious. Or they're quiet. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Or miserable. A lot That's, of comedians I know are ah, miserable. They are miserable. But I mean, that, but you know, misery feeds their act. I mean, they're identifying things that everybody can relate to that find pain and anguish and suffering in and shining a light on yeah i don't feel like sebastian so i feel like he's a pretty positive happy family guy but there's some really dark people that yeah louis ck i think is a very dark guy yeah very very you know he's he's been through the ringer yeah uh and a lot of these guys they, they, they'll they tell you how just you know they just kind of bask in sadness i think uh seinfeld seems pretty uh he seems like a pretty happy guy he's just what's the deal and they just walks mm. around doing what's the deal with everything yeah and you know I can see that. That. Okay. seinfeld Oh, Seinfeld. Yeah. Seinfeld. He's the happiest guy on the planet. He just gave he, I love his comedians in cars. I mean, he's just. That's a good one. He is funny. You ever uh, hey. run across Danny Trejo? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I did a couple movies with Danny. He's a hell of a nice guy, man. Okay, good. Did you guys interview him? I, we didn't interview him. I met him <clears throat> when I worked in Las Vegas for radio, and uh, he came to the radio station just completely down to earth, talked to everybody, took pictures. We hung out at a club later with uh, – he was good friends with one of the morning guys. And um, <laughs> my wife, who's a massage therapist, she comes up as we're leaving. He's in front of us, and she, she had a tendency when she got a few drinks in her to come up behind people and to start massaging their shoulders. So here's this guy who served time in San Quentin getting grabbed by the shoulders by my I'm like, yeah, it's probably not the best idea to do that. You know? <laughs> he probably loved it. I yeah, haven't tried okay. his donuts or his, I tried his tacos. He's got taco shops all over LA. I haven't tried his donuts though. Gotta I got try it for myself. Cause if I ever saw him, I wouldn't be able to say I had tacos and donuts. But yes, indeed, a sweet guy from day one. Really yeah. great. Yeah. Just a guy that he was a, he was a, a professional or a golden gloves boxer and they wanted him to, uh, uh, consult with Eric Roberts from what I heard. That's how he got his start. I'm yeah. so, in, yeah, I'm impressed that you brought up Eric Roberts. We might be inside each other's brains because from what I understand, Eric Roberts only acts with cue cards. Every film. It's uh, a, It could be an urban legend. I don't know. I wouldn't know. I mean, you know, there's a lot of actors that might be, you see this and go, that's what we do. You're just diminishing our whole craft and what we do to, you know, reading cue cards. So, you know, uh, I think I will do it not in place of, you got to show up. It's opening night on Broadway. As far as I'm concerned, you get on set and you better be ready to, to nail it. Take one. But it's the times when you're saying, when you're given something, a change of a script in the last moment or the night before, whatever. And it's a chunk this big. I don't sleep. I won't sleep. I remember auditioning for Reservoir Dogs. Remember that movie? Wow, oh, yeah. yeah. Tarantino. And Mr. Pink, Mr. Blue, whatever, were, monologues were a page and a half, and I stayed up for four days, and I went in and, and read for this thing, and um, Tarantino was there, Harvey Cattell was there, and, then I, and I was memorized. And then I remember... Son of a bitch. I remember getting the next day, okay, well, they want you to come back for Mr. Green or whatever the color, right? <laughs> and they said, and they want all the actors memorized. I'm like, I'm the fucking guy that went in memorized and set the stage for this shit. And now yeah. you know, yeah, I got to remember. And I had a feeling in my head that that's that, because I was oh, memorized, you know? I was like, so I think I sort of, and of course I didn't get it, but I did audition two, maybe three times I was called back. And didn't get it, but uh, it was early on, early, early in the day. I was just starting out, if you will, you know. The guys. Well, that's, yeah, that was early. I, so you're probably more living in a land of, uh, man, we know what Paul does. Bring him in. Offer. Yeah. These days, yes. I'm very, not to brag or anything like that, but thank God after 38 years of doing this shit, I'm, you know. Well, the last 
bunch of years. It's been, and I look back at the some of my stuff that I've done, and I realize a lot of it was offered stuff. And I read for less and less these days. Thank God, it's just nice to get that call. I don't care if it's a day on this or a month on that, but not to have to get back in the ring and sort of, you know, it's like that. It's like, let me suit up and get on a suit. Now it's so much easier with selfies. I, it's, you don't have to, again, I do those a lot with, with, uh, with cue cards. So you don't have to memorize and kill myself for a week, you know, shutting out the rest of the world to work on this. You know, it's a detective. It's a dad. It's whatever. It's not always that complicated. And, and, I've got a lot of this in me and I could just grab the words and do a nice audition. Nice. Nice and solid. Feel good about it. Send it out and, and get a job or not. Yeah. So, but I then, spent the last six months through COVID. Uh, you know, I have a setup in West Hollywood and my girlfriend reads the other lines and I've got my little lapel mic and I do my self tapes and you send it off to the acting gods and you hope that someone likes you. And if, and the, the main thing that I just am holding on to is, uh, don't take anything personally because there's so many things. The right person's got to get the job. And if it's not you that time, that's okay. Move on. Yeah, that still doesn't make you feel good. <laughs> yeah. It's it's easier to say in theory, right? <laughs> uh, I actually have been auditioning for voiceover stuff for the past year and a half, two years or so, and I haven't won one job. But because everybody and their mother is hanging a shingle out there and becoming a voiceover talent, that's what I'm up against. That's that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, with everything. Yeah. Yeah, they have a laptop and a USB mic, and they're like, I'm a voiceover artist. Closet full of clothes is all you need. Yeah. Well, it's like, not to go down this path, but, you know, all these Instagram models. Mm. I'm a model. I'm like, oh, any campaigns? Well, on Instagram, <laughs> what yeah. do you mean? <laughs> well, I've got, you know, followers, and I, but are you selling? Are you, you have a job? No, I'm, well, it's modeling, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, but that's they, they think they're models. Saying you're five one and three quarters, models generally are five eight minimum. I've <laughs> no models. I've worked with them going back to my face painting days. Yes, your face painting days. We didn't discuss that. But uh, yeah, this this younger world. I mean, you're great kids out there. You're wonderful, but you don't have a clue. Sorry. It's it's so interesting when you hit the five O and you're in the five O's. Jim's still five years away, and I just turned five O. And uh, it's just I'm trying not to be the guy's like get off my lawn, kid. You know I'm trying to be open minded oh. about everything. And I think what we do as creatives it gives us a it's like a youth pill. It really is. I mean the idea that I can go out there and take two sticks and hit a bunch of things made of metal plastic and call it a career. It's unbelievable. I get all my aggression out and I get to entertain people. It's so amazing. Yeah. Mm. Yep. We're lucky guys. Absolutely. We are lucky guys. Lucky young people that are finding their way as well and making businesses and careers and whatever they're doing. You know, God but hey, if I could be an influencer with 50, 55 you know, million people following me and I'm making tons of money because I'm I wear the right Whatever, I, 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 God bless, him. go for it. God bless him. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Hitting the right app. Let's see. No, oh, it's on. How did I do that? Yeah, you got to go with Instagram and TikTok these days. Oh my God. Yeah. Paul, I'm not doing TikTok. I just started watching some of that. My fiance is a lot younger and she shows me these TikTok things. I'm like, I don't want to see it. I don't want to. That's funny. Wait a minute. Yeah. It, there's a lot of creativity on it, right? There's some, yeah. Some funny guys. There's some yeah. really funny guys. There's a Trump guy that's hilarious. There's a, there's a guy that, I guess he's a Persian. Does his father. Do you know this guy? Uh, Jim, I know him. So, I think so. <laughs> yeah. We're watching this guy. Dad, Dad, I want to I wanna, uh, get some uh, Game Boy, whatever the stupid, you know. Eric, you know what you you are, you are a clown, Eric. I'm imitating a fucking guy on TikTok. I can't. <laughs> I got to stop. You got to stop. Uh, that's funny. I stop somewhere. The madness. So, I'm a guy on TikTok who's hilarious, by the way. If everybody sees this guy, he's very funny. <laughs> so after NYPD Blue, 
All right, let's get back in there. I mean, yeah. I just got to say, yeah. I mean, it's like a body of work. I mean, you go and you're doing, you did 14 episodes on The Wire, am I right? And then 17. 17 episodes and then at least seven episodes on Entourage. I want to talk about that because I honestly think that Jeremy Piven is one of the most underrated actors of our friggin' generation. He is awesome. I don't, I, I'm sorry, Entourage, and now we're talking about Jeremy Piven. Yeah, how did this happen? Jesus Christ. Thanks, Jim. Be, it's a fight. It's a fight. Every even get on a big time talk show like you guys, and I'm still <laughs> fighting for time. <laughs> this is not Jeremy's time, Jim. Jeremy's. Well, you yeah. know, I'm just saying. You, 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 great yeah. actors were on that show. Fantastic actors. Yeah, Martin yeah. Landau. Bum break. I had my scenes with Landau and Jeremy and uh, and and the wonderful. Uh, uh, Golf pro guy, my brain is slow. The golf pro. No, Who's the guy? Normally, oh, yeah. we were on the golf course playing golf together, and I had that heart attack scene. I don't know if you remember that. I remember that. Oof, that was so fun. No, Jeremy is phenomenal, and he commanded that set, and he just owned that guy. And um, managers that I was with at the time, they actually produced the show, and I remember getting the script early on for the pilot. And they were seeing every actor in the world. And then it said, a Jeremy Piven type. I said, yeah. just ask fucking Jeremy Piven. No, we want to use, you know, we want to get somebody else. And then they end up using Jeremy Piven anyway, because it was Jeremy Piven. It was written for him. And it was what a crazy business. It's crazy. Even he was probably, you know, and then he got it. I don't know exactly how it happened. Oh, oh. I, th I think one of the best scenes that, that needs to be reenacted and, and played over and over again for even just demonstration purposes for actors to work over is that scene with all you three sitting in your office. Because, I mean, the whole sales pitch that Martin Landau does. The, what if I told you that if I could have this movie and it outshines this movie, is that something you might be interested in? Hilarious. Just hilarious. Great writing on that show, man. That yeah. is the ultimate sales pitch. Yeah. yeah, you know, we haven't seen in a while was is the is the lead guy, Vince. Adrian. Yeah. Adrian. Sure. Yeah. Uh I know he does he's very active in uh uh you know with the planet and saving the earth. I know oh, he's, nice. He's very, very active in sort of social uh awareness. social justice change, that kind of stuff. I, I don't know. I, I'm, we 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 are friendly. We were friends long before Entourage, and I see him occasionally. He comes by. We hung out. Haven't talked to him in a while, so I'm not sure what he's up to. He used to shoot these short films that I did with him early before in his very early days, and we did these little strokes together. And so we had a nice connection. Vince, you know, Adrian is a great guy. Really, oddly enough, yeah. he actually was in a movie. Um, and I can't remember the name of it. it. Was it was? And here's a, another drumming tie-in. He was in a movie about air drumming. Oh, um, oh let me look it up. All that. Funny, the kid that actually directed that film, his name was Ari Gold. Ari his Gold, real right. name is, and it mm -hmm. had uh, Jane Lynch in it, and it, like all those. And uh, then the, the big, the big um, song to air drum to was Tom Sawyer. Yeah, Neil Peart. How about that? Small, small world. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. This is The Rich Redman Show. All right, we are back. And, of course, we're talking to Paul Ben Victor, one of the world's greatest character actors. And Paul said, I want to talk about the thing. We're going to talk about the thing that you're working on. Thing. Yeah. Things. It's things, Joey. <laughs> oh, Joey. A little bit. What about those things? A little bit. And, uh, not for nothing. Right. Oh, hands, Joey. <laughs> that means we get a chance to fight Joe Lewis. Best there is. Give me in the face. 
Me and Faze, Joey. It's been 20 years since we did that. It was way before <laughs> everybody was doing De Niro. Before De Niro, they were doing Brando. Before De Niro, Pacino. Who are they doing now? Who do kids do now? They do... Uh, uh, they do? They do a lot of them do Trump. I see a lot of Trump impressions mm. on TikTok. Yeah, of course. But, but who are the great actor? Morgan so, Freeman. Yeah. Yeah. He's tough. That's a tough impersonation. Yeah, but it's just sort of a relaxed, almost, uh, you know, uh, Clinton kind of sound. Almost. But no, there's, there's, that's what I think. I think the greats, you know, the greats, the, you know, the, 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 that we grew up with, you know. The, like Jimmy Stewart? Uh, Lee Jay Cobb, Bogey, Brando, I mean, Pacino, De Niro. Hmm. I mean, I love younger actors, some of them wonderful. I love that, the, the, well, there's so many. I, I was going to ask you, who are some of your, uh, some kids that are coming up that you're like, mm, yeah, he's going to do just fine. I don't watch enough. I mean, Tom Hardy, I think, is really... Wow. Bad. Yeah. Venom. It was great. It's not coming up anymore. These guys are already, you know, mid-career already. But, uh, yeah, I love to see a guy sort of really um, morph into other people, not just to a, themselves, which is always wonderful, but you know, Brad Pitt, I'm a big fan. And these guys, I don't really know the younger dudes. I really don't. Um, I'm sure they're coming up. I mean, they're out there. I don't really know. I just, but uh, yeah, I still am a fan of sort of our, my, my, uh, my years, my, you know, my, the stuff in my wheelhouse, the walk-ins and, and to see them on stage is the biggest treat. Walk-in was on Broadway a couple of years ago. And I missed it. I'm so pissed about that. But Pacino, I've seen, so many times and so inspired by his, he, he inspired me. I saw him do American Buffalo, I think off Broadway back in like junior high school or high school, whatever I was in. And uh, that changed me watching him bust out with that fucking Ruthie speech. I don't know if you know about the American <laughs> Buffalo. Fucking Ruthie I to, I, I'm, this is another one I'm adding to the list along with uh, your invisible man, 45 episodes. I got to find, I got to watch that. Oh, well, that was a fun one. That was a good one. Yeah. American that was a good one. That was a good one. Invisible man. That was a good one. It was, I got that and the three stooges like on the same day. Hey, wow. You had your work cut. You're like, Oh, I'm going to be busy. Around the same time. And yeah. I went to Australia to do the three stooges and they waited a month, I think for me to come back and went right into uh, two years of invisible man. It was an exciting time. Well, I was watching some clips from three stooges and I saw that you had, you guys had to recreate actually all the physicality and timing and everything of some of those original scenes, right? Yeah, we did. We rehearsed for about a month. Wow. A little more. In Australia, myself, Chickless, Evan Handler, uh, uh, John Kassir, and uh, the whole team. It was great. We had wow. an incredible time. In Australia, we had a drive on the, on the other side of the road. Remember, there's a scene I'm driving, but their cars are on the wrong side of the road, you know? Mm -hmm. And there were steering wheels on the wrong side of the car. Right. So my wife in the movie has a blanket over her lap, but she's steering with a little fake steering wheel. And I'm going like this and I'm not steering the car because the car was built backwards like that. So we had, that was a fun little uh, anecdote from that, but it was, a, it was a great time. It was a great time. And at the same time, I was writing a play with my mom, which was the thing. It was the oh. thing. Yeah, it was a play called The Good Steno about my mom's life as a stenographer, secretary in the 40s, 1940s, in a swimsuit showroom on, on Broadway. Wow. Garment Center. And it was, I'd say, definitely the early days of uh, the Me Too movement, if you will. You know, women were being young girls, the models were being really taken advantage of. Mm. And we wrote this play together. It's, based on all my mom's, she's a playwright, and uh, of her stories, and we put it together, and then we put it up here in town, in LA. It went to, New oh no, that one didn't go to New York. Another play went to New York, Club, Club Soda, that went to New York. But now we're developing it into a TV show. So, great. Cool little TV period show. So a couple of years ago, my director friend Dave Rodriguez said, Paul, dust off the good steno. Me Too thing is happening right now. And yeah all about that and we we had it 
up here five, seven years before that. He goes, dust that thing off. It's very current right now, you know, sadly, but it's current. And um, so we're trying to get that going as a show. It's great. Uh, you know, it's all about the good steno. It might be called Gloria. It might be called the good steno, but it's a really, really dynamite, dark, twisted comedy in a way of, of the time. And I will play uh, Morty, the boss, who is this massively disgusting, despicable scumbag that would try to get the models to go in the back room with the buyers from out of town and yeah. have uh, whiskey sours and watch French films that were not French. There was nobody French in them. <laughs> speaking French. They're, well, they're, well, that's cool. That's a cool opportunity. And because I, because I wondered if your parents were back then were supportive with your decision to go into the arts because they were kind of in the arts themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Dad's trade was a uh, hairdresser, hair cutter, but um, at a very prominent place in New York, Kenneth's at the time. He actually mm -hmm. did Princess Grace's hair once and some other uh, major people. And um, mom is a playwright artist. So, but going into acting, they were not supportive at the time. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I went to Carnegie. That was cool. But when I wanted to act, they were like um, very supportive for me my whole life creatively. But the acting, they was like, oh, my God. Uh, we, you loved astronomy when you were young. Maybe you want to do that. Let's go back to explore that. And I was like, I did. I liked it. Eight years old, I had an astronomy book. And I was. I love I still love astronomy, but very quickly I started getting little gigs and they said, okay. And then they were on board and always been very supportive. My mother is an incredible creative force, was since a kid and still is now a big force in my life creatively. Dad is too. He's gone now, but mom, he remains a tremendous creative force. And she, she's still, is, she, is she in California? Do you get to she's visit her? In New York. She's in New York, but she's still writing at 89 years old. Playwright. Oh, wow. She published a book of her pieces recently. Uh, it's great. She's yeah. Too, yeah. We talk every day. It's great. She's terrific. She's terrific. Amazing. We're going to try to get this show going. I'm with Zero Gravity Management, and they're going to help try to produce it. And uh, we'll see. We're looking for the right writer right now to put it together. So it's a dream, a wow, just to shoot this and get it off the ground. It's a great piece. I'm very, very proud of the, uh, the play that we did, and hopefully we can turn it into some kind of either a limited, episode, limited series thing, eight episodes, or maybe, maybe longer. I don't know. Yeah, so many platforms now. I mean, there's, I, I think uh, in the height of everything, there was over 500 shows being shot, which is what a great time to be in TV, the golden age of yeah. TV. Yeah, yeah. We are, we're saying what you said, we are lucky though, because we're sort of, we've done our tenure, you know, we've done, we've, we've been through the, the battle zone. We've, you know, as a musician, as a musician, voice guys, actor, we, we're like over the hump. We just got to like survive a few more years. I feel it's tough for kids starting now, man. I wouldn't want to right now. Like, wow. Yeah. I don't know. How would we be able to navigate through these rough waters right now? If you're starting out, can you imagine? The drummers, yeah. the drummers, yeah. they, they're like, you see these kids, the the little kids from all over the world, they're six years old. How about that little girl? I think she's a little Asian girl. She's playing to the Zeppelin thing. You ever see that? Oh, yeah. There's so many of them. There's a little girl that just did a drum battle with Dave Grohl. And so you're like, okay, this is fantastic. There's all this extreme talent, but... Um, is she better than him? I mean, she's like six and she's... She's just kind of holding her own. She's just like playing along and she's not intimidated. She's like, I'm jamming with Dave Grohl. Yeah, but what, did you see that girl play? You know, dun, 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 what was the who's? Yeah, dun, uh, was, uh, uh, good, uh, good times, bad times, uh, Zeppelin? Uh, yeah, whatever it was. And she's... Yeah, with the cowbell and all that. Killing it. With singles, I mean, the whole, I was blown. You ever see this kid? Yeah. I was in the Guitar oh, no. Center drum battle with uh, uh, Tony Royster Jr. I was 25, and here we are at the House of Blues on Sunset, which, which is now condos. And uh, this kid was 11 years old and just wiped us all clean and yeah. uh, now is Jay-Z's drummer. I remember that kid. Yeah. yeah. The Jay-Z kid. Yep. 
like the drummer. He was like he was like a Billy Cobham in a way. He was like like mm-hmm. super fast all over the place. And he was yeah. I was like, hey, what are you gonna do for your drum solo, Tony? And he's he's eleven years old, and he's like, I'm gonna do the helicopter. And I'm like, oh, isn't that cute? And I went out and did my twenty five year old drum solo, overeducated college guy. And um, and he went out there and just. Did, it, that's the helicopter and everybody loved it. And he won. Of course he won. <laughs> He's 11. It was amazing. But he, where did they get the, I thought you needed certain like mature muscles to have those, that kind of speed, but you really don't. You God, I don't know. I think it's just that it's just repetition. It's like, how do I attack this chunk of dialogue? You know, that's been that's one cool. of the goals and I don't know if we could continue talking for a while cause I love it. But I would love, and I tell drummers like you, I, like how are you? How are your singles? You got a good. How's Jim? How's your single stroke? Well, is he pretty good? Yeah. My single strokes are. Uh, I after thirty years of playing, I've actually I have a practice pad next to my uh, studio rig, and every now and then I'll turn around and just go just do some doubles and singles. But um, I'm I'm rusty. I got to shake off the rust. Apparently, uh, and, playing and for forty five minutes every two weeks is not enough practice. So, do you have a good? Yeah, I have good singles so I can do the live from Hollywood, California. And then I can go to my press roll for the Star Spangled Banner. And then I can go to my open, say hello to my little friend, machine gun roll, which is so the three types. Um, you know, and I have so much time and muscle memory in the trenches that um, I've been taking time off, you know, from, from that thing and exploring some other things. Rich, Rich has got some of the most buttery smooth drum rolls, double stroke rolls you'll ever see. Oh, buddy. We're here. Not bad for a country western drummer. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I? Well, I'll, I want to see because I, I love watching drummers, but I, my dream is one day to have a single stroke roll. And I was starting to get there a few years ago where I either was dreaming about it or I really was able to do it, but it was kind of a combination. I was able to get to a little bit of that, a little bit of that like thing where your hands start doing it on their own. And, but my dream is to have a, a good, like a, a speedy, single stroke roll before I die. Is that possible? Oh, it's good. No, you just start off with with eighth notes. So the click, you know, and you just do that and then you increase the tempo so you're going through that pyramid. Either that or you could just do it with your mouth and that sounds just as good. Yeah. You could do these crazy kids with their... Or the 64ths. Yeah, they all Drake and all the modern hip hop. I yeah. like hip hop from the '90s when it was just more, you know, with the 808 kids. And the, yeah. You know that thing. Yeah, yeah. It's. <laughs> I was like, what did I get myself into? Uh, Damn, Steve well, Cooper. Well, you, maybe you guys just need when you get out to LA again, Rich. You guys just need to get together. Well, I'm, and, yeah, I'm right uh, around the corner. When, when when it becomes yeah. safe, oh, I'll I, come I, and. I may steal a lesson from you at some point. You have a. You have a. You have a. You have a. You have a, you have a, you have a Kit set up somewhere. Yeah, we can. Uh, yeah, we can use. Uh, I got a space over in North Hollywood. You know, boom, boom, boom. Or I'll, I'll knock on your basement. Like break out the electronics. I'll bring my pad. Boom. Why don't we do? Why don't we? Why don't we shoot a little drum lesson one day? It'd be incredible. Should. <laughs> it could be comedic, like the McDonald's commercials, like the two buddies. Yeah, yeah, we could do it like that. Yeah, the, the two buddies thing. I'll, <laughs> I'll do the feet. Oh, you gotta, on. you gotta look up Thomas Lang. We just had him on the show last Friday. Thomas Lang, what do I know that name? Thomas Lang, well, he started off his career playing with Falco and the Spice Girls, and then he became one of the world's most, like, insane, speedy, progressive, you know, rock, metal, funk, fusion guys. And he lives right over in uh, Thousand Oaks. Wow. Yeah. Love that guy. Really, really, really really fantastic. Well, hey, do you you see a memoir in your future? You going to tell your story? I just did. You did? How do I, I not know? Oh, go. Okay. In writing, in writing, in print. Oh, you mean, what do you do? You write that? I know I don't really. No. Uh, mm. You know. Well, you get a ghostwriter. You get a ghostwriter. You get. Who's going to read it? You, a couple of your friends? Who's gonna I don't. It? Hey, Judy you know? Greer has a book. I read her book. I read all sorts of books on ACT. I'll read your book. Yeah, tomorrow. Who Greer? Remember Judy Greer? She's kind of like, um, yeah. God. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. She wrote a book kind of like, I think it was called. Um, how do I know you? You know, cause you always get stopped everywhere and people are like, yeah, I would hate to write that book. <laughs> cause 
you know, uh, yeah, that guy or whatever, you're that guy. Because I've gotten that a lot. I, I'm finally, since The Wire anyway, it's like, okay, there's, we know who you are. Um, and it's, you know, but uh, I don't know, memoir. I don't know if somebody came up to me and said, we're interested in your story. But it, it is a story, I guess, because it's, to me, I'm just, I, I swear to God, I always feel like, not that I'm just starting out, but I just feel like I'm in the middle. Mm-hmm. You know, just catching my stride when in fact, I, I can't believe it's been, you know, 1982, I got my SAG card, you know, so. Beautiful. But I'm still waiting for that moment, that, that role, that wonderful thing that, you know, I still love that, that more uh, sort of piece that, that, that lands, you know, the show would be great. I'd love to write this thing, have that come out or some cool, uh, there's a movie called All Rise that has not come out yet. There's a TV show of the same name, not mm-hmm. that. And I, we did it, it went to Sundance a couple of years ago. I watched that, I said, holy shit, this is it. This is a great movie. Um, John Legend did the music, Jennifer Hudson is it, Jeffrey Wright is in it, uh, a couple, some wonderful actors. And I said, this is it, this is it, this is gonna hit, this is gonna hit big. And for whatever reason, producers, they wanted it re-edited, they changed it, it's been edited, it hasn't come out yet. But this was it, and I play this really kind of tough, nasty, barracuda uh, prosecuting attorney. Nice. And I said, this is gonna win, Sunday, this is gonna come out, I got this part. This is going to really like launch kind of role. It hasn't come out. Mm. So that's something I'm looking forward to having come out at some point, whether it be on video or theatrical, whatever it could do. Yeah. But it's kind of role. That was a role that I was really looking forward to happening. But then, you know, and then vinyl happened, did a season, gets canceled. So a lot of it is, you know, with us, it's that, luck of the draw once you're in the game you know you, that series would have it's gonna go or it's not gonna go you know you gotta but i'm in the game and i still love it it's great see what comes up next as well said once in an interview he goes i take what come no, i won't do it i take what comes next he takes what comes next and uh you know if it's something that Rings true to him, but I remember reading once about Chris Well. He's been a big inspiration for me. He goes, like, you know, because he's done the biggest iconic movies, and then he'll do a bunch of little ones you've never heard of. Before. And music videos. What music video did he do? It was it was it was incredibly famous. Jim, do you know? Christopher Walken was in a music video for it like was in, uh, where he did the dancing. Fat Boy Slim. Yeah, Fat Boy Slim. Yeah, yeah Fat Boy Slim, and he danced. You know, he danced all around. Great dance. He used to dance. On Avenue M, I think he told me, right? He's where I grew up in Brooklyn. There was a uh, TV studio there. He danced as a kid. He started dancing, hoofing, tap, and all that at five, six years old, I think. He told me. On True Romance, I, I sat him down and chewed his ear off for about uh, an hour once. And uh, at a lunch, I sat there. I said, so, you know, I was picking his brain. He was sweet, nice to talk to me. And it was great. Girlfriend loves that movie, and it's been forever since I've seen it, so we'll probably re-watch it. Yeah, it's been a while since I've seen it. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at this body of work, I mean, God, it's just so incredible. I mean, just The the Wire, Monk, Entourage, The Shield, My Name is Earl, like all these walk-ons. Santa Clarita Diet loved that. Two episodes, man. Uh, you know, uh, Drew Barrymore walking around Santa Clarita eating people as a zombie. Yeah. Very, I, very fun. Yeah. Well, well you know, what, what are your take on the Marvel movies? I'm a big Marvel guy. I Jim's mean, a huge Marvel guy. They've, they've taken um, over the world. I, I got to say, I don't, I don't, it's not my, uh, my first uh, go-to. I'm more of an indie documentary guy. You know, gotcha. I'll do those maybe once every couple of years. I'll get the popcorn, go to the theaters. I don't know about now, but let's go see a big movie just for fun. But I'm not a, like a, like you are probably a diehard fan with the Star Wars and the Marvel and all that stuff. I just only never... with Marvel. Oh, Marvel! Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, it's like a hobby. You're into yeah. it, it's great. You know, you get to this age and you got to find the things that give you joy in life, and that's for some crazy. reason, that's just one of them. I love it. I, I kind of envy that sometimes, but I I will go more to uh, I'll just binge from the Forensics Files till four in the morning sometimes, which is <laughs> really not the best thing because I'll end up locking my doors and trying to say shit i wish i had a gun because someone's gonna kill me but 
that, that I don't know, uh, like watching how they figure out, not the show forensics, you know, the fake ones, but the real shows. Yeah. Real docu and, and documentaries. Oh, music documentaries. Yeah, there's a yeah. million right now on Netflix. It's my favorite. Yeah, I just I watched the Quincy one. I watched the David Foster one. I watched the, the, the all of them. Clive David, you saw Clive that? Dick, great. Muscle Shoals. Muscle Shoals. I got some friends that were in that one. Yeah. I mean, these because I grew up being a drummer and a musician back in the day. It's, it's still in some ways my very first love, rock and roll, and that we have been alive in one of the greatest explosions of music in since the beginning of time. Since sure. Start and. But we've been alive in the rock and roll era when there was the Zeppelins and the Beatles and, you know, it, and the stories are just, did you just watch uh, when we were brother, when we were brothers, the band one recently? I haven't seen that. Um, I saw the, um, when we were brothers, check it out. It's okay. unbelievable. Cause yeah. you know, they played for Dylan and, uh, you know, also a great drummer, you know, uh, Levon Helm. He was oh, somebody and who did a little acting as well. And Chickless love plays drums. Good. Yeah. yeah. Chickless plays drums. So it's like the list is like, it's insanely long of, of yeah. uh, actors that love to play the drums. It's yeah, amazing. It was good. He played once in my, we're friends. He played in my living room. I think we're friends on Facebook, but I don't know if it's the real Mike Chickless. I don't know. I have no idea. I can't tell. He's good. <laughs> Do you want to ask ask a random question? Oh, yeah. Paul, this is one of our favorite parts of the episode where Jim, off of the World Wide Web, will ask you a completely random question. And we even have a jingle that goes like this. It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. This will be a fun question, I think, for you. Ready? Good luck. I'm telling you, I may just go next, pass. <laughs> pass. <laughs> All right, here we go. Go ahead. Hey. What would you name your boat if you had one? What would I name my boat? Uh, we have a we had a little sunfish as a kid. My sister has it now. What's the name of it? I don't know. I'm gonna just say pumpkin. There you go. Oh, yeah, like it. it's pumpkin, pumpkin. spices and all year round on the boat. Perfect. I love oh, that. That was the name of our first uh, my, my cat. The mean little freaking cat. Pumpkin the cat was mean? He bit everybody. I think my sister, somebody closed him in a, in a, um, a couch once. What is your indulgence? Are you a car guy, boat guy? What do you like? Uh, I wasn't a car guy as a kid. I'm becoming more of one now. When I see the, 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 all the uh, muscle cars that I grew up with in the 70s, yeah. we used to go, ah, oh, man, what does that guy think he is? you know, with the loud, and now I would kill for one of those because they're beautiful. Yeah. Gorgeous. You know, these beautiful old muscle cars from the 70s. Um, so I wasn't a, a, I wasn't a, uh, so what was the question? Because I could probably answer this. Well, I mean, what your indulgence, what do you like to do? Other than oh. Cigars? Are you a cigar guy? Steakhouses, maybe. Oh, yeah. nice. The best steak in town. I just, had a, I just had a fabulous, um, what did I have? Uh, filet down in uh, Houston. The mm, I, I, I always order the same thing. Some guys are sirloin guys. Some are, no, I'm always the filet. Oh, you're a filet guy. I'm a ribeye yeah. guy. Always the filet, man. It's like, like when jo Joey Pants in the Matrix, he's eating the filet and he's like, ignorance is bliss. Yeah. <laughs> that is lying in that? That's yeah. his, yeah, because he sold his friends out to the enemies in the Matrix yeah. and to they, the machine. they gave him whatever he wants wine, women, songs, steaks. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah, I, I will travel for a great steak. In fact, is anybody, you're not in Chicago, no. What's the Gibsons, I think, in, in Chicago? A steak, there was one of the best. Mm -hmm. Steak, sushi, but more of a hobby. Cigars, no. Cars, no. Uh, I don't Drums. know. Drums, music. Definitely concerts. I'll try to, because I feel like they are, they're almost more valuable than a painting like a Picasso, which is worth millions. To me, it's worth it to go see whoever is your guy because they're going to go away and they'll never to be seen again. If you could see the last, you know, that's why I'm kicking myself. I didn't see The Who or Zeppelin a few years when they were coming yeah. out. I did see McCartney a couple times, you know, Crosby Stills I grabbed a couple times, uh, you know, but concerts, there's mm -hmm. 
So, it's an experience. That's what the, the, the millennials are into. They're putting their money into experiences and then you have, you could tell well, those stories forever. But Paul, are you walking into the front door and getting frisked at the forum and going in there with general admission? No, you're going, you're going into side stage the backstage. Got the, got the little thing on the side right this way. Come oh, on. Yeah. You, I don't like to be out there general admission. You kidding me? No, no, no. Yeah, radio killed it for me too. I'm a big. I love country. I'm a big, big country music fan. We well, this is great. We didn't really talk about that. We didn't. No, I love. It started with Hank Williams in, the, in a little Irish bar in Manhattan. A little buddy of mine who's since passed. He goes, Paul. You know, you know Hank Williams, original guy. And I started listening. I was my bucket got a hole in it. it was like I, all those songs. It got me into it. The old days. The old yeah. Days. Oh, yeah. I played with uh, Hank Williams the third, which is you know the grandson. So oh, I played. Is yeah, played, he played. Yeah, I played with him in 1999, and we that like I, when I was kind of coming up, and that's right when I met Jason Aldean, and we've all been. It's the same band playing with Jason for 21 years, five presidencies, same band. Wow. And we're just having so, a blast, and we're yeah, we're just waiting you, for COVID to kind of go away, and then we're going to go back and take the music to the people, man. Well, oh, please, please, you know I want to be there. Yeah, when we're in LA, oh. we'll get you the one of those uh, preferential seats. Follow the flashlight. Yeah. I want a thing with around my neck with a cord, you know, one of those. And I'm the mixologist backstage. I make all the cocktails. So. You've never done that for me. I've never had the, the flash. Sure you have. I had your entire seat. family backstage. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, yeah, we were backstage with his family and his kids go, Where do, when are we going backstage? And he's like, we are backstage. Because yeah. people get back there and they're expecting like Nirvana, not the band, but a, a magical place. And it's like sweaty cheese, stinky clothes, and road cases. Yeah, right. pretty much. Really? They wanted to meet Jason, so. <laughs> Everybody does. Uh, yeah. Paul, thank you so much for your time, man. Yes, absolutely. This is great. Will it to be continued. Absolutely. Guys, thanks so much for listening. And if you enjoy the show, subscribe, share, rate, and review. And if you got some questions or comments or just praise for Jim and I, I got an email address for you, Show at gmail.com. Keep coming back for the good stuff. See you next time. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com.